All right, subscribers, welcome back to another episode of Science with Serbac. Today, what we're going to be talking about is section 15.2, and that's going to dive a little bit deeper into the properties of those waves or those characteristics of waves. So before we get started, I just have a couple of objectives that I want you to be able to meet by the end of this video. Objective number one, determine the ways to measure and compare waves. Objective number two, determine how you can calculate the speed of a wave. And objective number three, determine why the pitch of an ambulance or train uh, changes as the vehicle comes towards you and goes away from you. All right, so we'll get started here uh, with some formal definitions. Now, in section one, I outlined and I went over some of these definitions, uh, but I never gave any formal writing here. So we start here with our basic um, terms associated with a wave. And this first term, this first term is amplitude which is defined as the maximum distance that the particle of a wave's medium vibrate from their rest position. So simply put, the amplitude is essentially the height of a particular wave. Now, a transverse wave, which I'll, I'll draw here in a second, they're all going to have similar shapes. And that similar shape forms that almost sideways S shape. So again, we have the up and down portions of the wave and the amplitude. If you can remember from section one, we drew that dotted line in the middle and that's that particle's rest position. So the amplitude, what we're talking about here on a transverse wave is this portion from rest to the crest or vice versa. We could go just as easy from this dotted line, the rest position to the trough. Both of those things would refer to the amplitude of a transverse wave. Now, we get down to this term uh, known as a sine wave. And, oh, I forgot a E. It should be not sine waves, but R sine waves. Ah, that looks better. Um, our sine waves, what these things are, they are ideal transverse waves and they have an S shape. So an ideal transverse wave is going to have the same shape as a sine curve. Now, I, I didn't draw this perfectly, but if you can imagine a perfect up and down portion of a transverse wave, that is essentially a sine wave. Now, most waves, most transverse waves are not perfect. So most waves aren't going to have this perfect sine curve. Now they're going to be close to it, but there's going to be some variance. And then the last point I want to make about the amplitude is this. The greater the amplitude equals the greater the energy transfer from that wave. So the bigger we get this amplitude, the more energy is transferred. Now we get down to this term of wavelength. And we're going to have to separate out transverse versus longitudinal waves to distinguish between these two wavelengths. But a wavelength is simply defined as the distance from any point on a wave to an identical point on the next wave. So even though we can pick any point on a wave, typically what we're, we're going to pick is a very consistent point and a very uh, a point that's identifiable. Uh, now, what we have here, it wavelength is going to represent or be represented by the symbol that's a Greek symbol here. It's actually called lambda. And it almost looks like an upside down Y. And again, this symbol right here, this symbol right here 
is representing that Greek symbol lambda, which is equivalent in our case here uh, to, to our wavelength. That's what we need to know about that. Now, the wavelength is going to vary for our transverse and our longitudinal wave. So for our transverse wave, the wavelength is the distance from one crest to the next or from one trough to the next. So if we draw a picture here of a transverse wave, we would obtain a picture like this. And so a wavelength can be one of two things. It can be from trough to trough. And again, that is one wavelength. I'm not gonna squeeze that in. Or it can be from a crest to crest. Either way, these things represent one wavelength of this particular transverse wave. Now with our longitudinal wave, remember it was like our slinky, and so we have to define a wavelength in a slightly different pattern, or a slightly different method here. A longitudinal wavelength is the distance between two compressions or between two rarefactions. So again, the best way to see a longitudinal wave is through a picture. So what I'm going to draw here with my curly cues here, I'm gonna draw a rare fraction and then I'm going to compress this spring that I have really close together and then I'm going to again spread these out to go to a rare fraction and then I'm going to compress them again and we'll end with another rare faction. So um, the curly cues here represent a spring that's really squished together and then the uh, spread out represent that rare faction. And so again, what we have here is a wavelength is from uh, two compression, so from an equal point from one compression to the next, right there, right there what I just drew is the wavelength of one longitudinal wave. Again, just as a reminder, it's between uh, two compressions or two rare factions. The compressions are the items here that are squished together and then the rare factions the rare fa fractions here are these items that are spread out and that's what we call the rare faction okay so those are the details for amplitude and wavelength what we're going to shift over to is period and frequency. Now, period and frequency are two terms that I talked about, I talked about in uh, section one. And so the period, once again, is just defined as the time it takes for a complete cycle or wave oscillation to occur. So more simply put, for a transverse wave, and that's virtually where everything for us is gonna be based on, is it's going to be the time between two successive wave crests. Or if we're talking about, we're, we're talking about a um, longitudinal wave, we are going to have the time required for one full wavelength to pass a certain point. And again, this first point up here is referring to a transverse wave. And then down below, this uh, additional definition here is dealing with a longitudinal, a longitudinal uh, wave. Now, one thing that we have to talk about here is our symbols. So the symbol for period is represented by the symbol of a capital T. That's all it is, T for time. 
And the unit that we use, the SI unit, remember the International System of Units, what we use in science, the unit for a period here is going to be an S for seconds. Now, the frequency on the other hand is going to be is going to be defined as the number of cycles or vibrations per unit of time. So the big difference between frequency and period is this. Period, you're starting that stopwatch right when one crest of a transverse wave goes by, and then you're stopping the stopwatch immediately when that next crest passes. Frequency, on the other hand, is giving a certain time, let's say one second for simplicity purpose, and you're gonna measure how many waves pass during that given time period. So again, you time a whole wave, you're given for frequency a designated amount of time. And so uh, frequency is just simply going to be the number of waves in a given time. And what we do, we represent uh, frequency with this fancy F symbol. And so when you see frequency, it almost looks like an F with a tail or how I drew it is almost like an S, but that's our symbol for frequency. And then the unit, the unit, the SI unit that we use for frequency is known as the Hertz. And the Hertz is written like this. And more commonly how we'll find it is it has a symbol of capital H lowercase z. And what this represents, the SI unit for Hertz, is the measure of vibrations per second. So one Hertz, one Hertz as an example here, one HZ is going to equal one vibration, one vibration per second. So one complete wave cycle goes through per that second. Now, to give you an idea here, human ears, human ears can hear between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. That's, that's the frequency. Those high-pitched dog whistles are normally gonna have a higher frequency than 20,000, and so that's why our ears can't pick up those high-pitched dog whistles. Now, there has to be some way to tie both of these things together, and there is one way that we can do this. So written out here, simply put, the fre frequency is the inverse of the period. Again, that, that definition's great, but I like to see it in a formula. So the formula that we have for that statement written above, the formula that we have is this. The frequency, which we're going to represent with that fancy F, is equal is equal to one divided by our P4 period. And I'm gonna actually write that out, P4 period. Okay, so uh, that represents our uh, inverse there. Now, if a wave passes every two seconds, that means it has a period of two seconds, the frequency would be one divided by two or 0.5 of a hertz. And we're gonna see that here in our example on the next page. So if we switch over pages here, we can now talk about wave speed and there is an equation and there is, there is a way to solve those problems. So the wave speed is just defined as the speed of the wave that is equal to wavelength divided by period or to frequency multiplied by wavelength. So there's our formal definitions there of these formulas written out. And we can have two different equations depending on whether we're given the period or the frequency. And in a few moments here, we'll consolidate and have a specific formula that we'll use. 
But going forward here, uh, this is simply uh, put into two things. So both of these things with wave speed can be summarized in one of two things. One, how fast a wave moves, or two, how far the wave travels in a certain amount of time. So again, I like to see things in simple forms, uh, especially with mathematical operations here. And so I like to write down my formula that we will utilize, especially in this next problem. So we have a few things here. We get this fancy looking symbol V is going to equal our symbol for frequency times our symbol for wavelength here. So these are some odd Greek symbols here. And so this V is going to represent wave speed. And this is important here. It's going to be in meters per second. Then our F for frequency is going to be written out in units of hertz, which remember a hertz, and I'm gonna write this down, is also equal to one divided by a second. That's the same thing as a hertz. And then this Greek symbol lambda, remember, is representing our wavelength, and that, that needs to be represented in meters or in units of meters. So now we can move down to this problem below. And there are, is quite a bit of info on this particular problem. So anyways, we have the frequency of the middle C on a piano have a frequency of 262 hertz. And we have a sound wave uh, of this particular metal C that has a wavelength of 1.30 meters. We wanna know what is the speed of the sound wave of this middle C. So the formula that we are going to be utilizing is going to be that one that we wrote up just above. So we write our formula that we use down. And then I always like to write down what I have and what I don't have. So I start out here with my wave speed. Nowhere in the problem does it mention anything about meters per second. So this wave speed ends up being our question mark. Now the frequency is in Hertz. And so the item listed here in Hertz is 262 hertz and then the wavelength of this middle c is going to be 1.30 meters so what i do is i plug this all back into my formula and so i get 262 hertz which is one over seconds times 1.30 meters. So when I plug this into my calculator, all I'm going to do, all I'm going to do is I am going to take 262 times 1.3 and I get a value of 340.6 and I'm going to round it to three total digits. So this would actually round to 341. And remember the unit for this is going to be meters per second. That's how we determine, that's how we determine the speed of a wave, or we put that unit. So now we have to talk about, well, why would wave speed different? Obviously you could vary the frequency and you could vary the wavelength, but if we didn't vary that, how could a speed of this same item right here, this same piano C note, how could it vary from place to place? And so that's what we are going to be talking about here on this particular page. 
So the major difference that we have in wave speed, and again, think we have that middle C, and we're just going to, to use that middle C as the example. And the major thing here is the wave speed is going to depend upon the medium the waves travel through. So remember that medium is just saying, uh, what is it traveling through? For example, an earthquake's medium is earth. Um, a ocean wave's medium is water. And it all depends how fast a wave is going. It all depends on what particular medium that it is going through. And now here's an important uh, point here. The wave speed is determined by the state of matter of the medium through which it travels. So the state of matter, what we're meaning here is solid liquids or gases. So I'm gonna make that point here, solid liquid or gas. Depending on which of those three things we have, which of those three mediums that, that is, is going to affect our wave speed. Now, the other point I wanna make here before we talk about the specifics of the state of matter is this. We can have the speed of the wave, the speed of the wave is always going to be constant in a given medium. So what that means here is that if we are in, let's say a liquid, for example, as our medium, that speed is always going to be constant throughout that medium. Now it can change if you go from one medium to, to another, but that's not our focus right now. We're looking at one medium at a particular time. So let's dive right into our states of matter and how they affect our wave speed. So number one here, we have gas. And in a gas, molecules are far apart and move randomly. So what this means for us is that molecules in a gas must travel a great distance before bumping into another molecule. So before they can pass that wave or go through the, the medium, uh, the wave has to travel quite a distance. And because of this, the waves are going to travel the slowest through this gas. And so we move to a liquid. And so in a liquid state of matter, molecules are much closer in liquids and gases and are free to slide past one another. So in a liquid, uh, waves are going to travel faster in a liquid than in a gas. And I squeeze that in here, but again, waves are gonna travel faster in a liquid and a gas. And if you take talking, for example, so I'm talking uh, and you can hear me through the microphone. If I were to go underwater, and I'm sure people have tried this before, if you go underwater and you try to talk, it's really distorted. And that's because that sound wave that you talk normally is moving a lot faster and it's distorted by our ears. Our ears can't pick it up as normal sound as we would hear in the atmosphere of, of Earth and those gases. And so in a solid state of mat matter, the molecules are the closest together and they are bounded tightly to one another. So what happens here with a solid is that those vibrations from waves, what happens here is they can be transferred from one molecule to another very quickly because they are right next to each other and they're almost locked in place. So kind of uh, right next to each other, like I said, and they can transfer that wave very quickly. So because of this, waves in a solid, waves that travel through a solid medium are going to move the fastest. So one example I like to give is the wave speed or the wave speed of sound waves. So our example here is wave speed of sound. And so in air, in air at 
uh, standard atmospheric pressure. That means, hey, you go outside. In air, which is a gas, it is going to be equal to 340 meters per second. Now that's me talking. My voice is vibrating the microphone at 340 meters per second. And if I were to go underwater, remember I talked about this being distorted. In water, the wave speed is three to four times faster. So three to four times faster than that of air. And again, because it's faster, our brain can't pick it up underwater, and that's why when you try to talk to somebody, it is going to be really dis distorted. So, now we get uh, into this. We talked about the uh, speed, and we did a lot of sound examples. Let's go ahead, let's transfer over and talk about the speed of light now. And it has some unique qualities and unique characteristics. So we start out here with the speed of light and we look at this. The speed of light has this general definition of in empty space electromagnetic waves are going to travel at the same speed. Now electromagnetic waves is another way to say light. And with this, in empty space, the speed of light is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now, the speed of light, this 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, the speed of light is represented by this symbol of a lowercase c. And now, our speed of light is going to travel much slower in a medium um, such as water and air. And I'll write that down here in a second. So this speed of light, yes, we're gonna use 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, but just know if light was traveling through air, so like our atmosphere, it's going to move much slower because it has to go from um, one point to another, there's some other factors that, that slow it down in that. So now we get to this, this uh, portion of visible light. Now visible light is defined as the light human eyes can detect. Now the frequencies that a human eye can detect range from 4.3 times 10 to the 14th hertz to 7.5 times 10 to the 14th hertz. And so the color that the human eye see is caused by the difference in the frequency of light. All right, so that brings us to the electromagnetic spectrum. And so the electromagnetic spectrum here is just going to be defined as the full range of light at all frequencies and wavelengths. And if you just Google or you do a little research here and you type in electromagnetic spectrum uh, to a, a search engine, what you'll find is you'll get most likely this visible light, which will be the rainbow colors, but then you'll also get a wide variety of other electromagnetic radiation, which will, would include things like X-rays and radio waves and microwaves, all of those things are considered to be light in our sense because they fall under this category of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now the other thing that we have here is we can do some calculations. We can actually do some writing of our formulas. And so our formulas, we're actually going to have two and we have here with our uh, formulas, we have this. Before I even write either of these two things, we have the speed of light is a constant. And so I'm gonna make a side note over here. The speed 
of light is a constant, meaning it's always going to be the same for us. And for us, what we're going to use for the speed of light is going to be three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now, what we have here is this. Uh, we have uh, one formula here where our speed of light, C, equals our frequency times our wavelength. And I was mistaken here, this should be formula, not formulas, um, minor adjustment here. And so our C, remember, equals speed of light, which we said is always a constant. It is always going to be that 3.8 meters per second. Our F is the frequency, and then the lambda symbol is our wavelength. And I'm running out of room here, so I'm gonna write it above the frequency, but that is the wavelength. And remember, that is in meters, and frequency is measured in that unit of hertz. So we can calculate any, any light. We can actually calculate the frequency and we can calculate the wavelength if we assume we're at this constant speed of light, which for us, we are always going to assume that we have the same speed of light. So now this brings us back, or this takes us to our final portion of today. And that is talking about the Doppler effect. Now, the Doppler effect is just defined as an observed change in the frequency of a wave when the source of observer or observer, excuse me, is moving. So this is best explained uh, when you have something like an, an ambulance uh, coming towards you. As it comes towards you, what happens is the frequency is going to change and as it comes closer, it's actually going to sound louder. And that's because both that vehicle, that, that emergency service vehicle, is coming closer and those sound waves are coming closer. So what's happening is the wavelength gets smaller and smaller and smaller, which means the pitch is going to increase. So a couple important things that happen here. The motion between the source of waves and the observer creates a change in observed frequency in this Doppler effect. And so what happens here is by changing that frequency, what we have is a change in pitch. And this change in this change in pitch can occur in uh, light, sound, or any other types of waves. And so we get down to this concept of pitch, and a pitch is going to be determined by the frequency at which sound waves strike the eardrum in your ear. So the bottom line up front here with pitch is the higher pitches is going to be a cause from higher frequencies. So the best way to think about this is through an actual example here. And we've probably all heard about the uh, a train horn. And so if you're stopped at a railroad crossing, you hear that train and it starts to come towards you and the horn uh, gets laid on by the conductor. And so we have two things occurring. The first thing is as the train moves towards you. And so as it moves to you or as it moves towards you, what happens is the sound waves from the horn are compressed. So as that sound wave is compressed, the distance between those wave fronts are shortened and the observed pitch is higher, which means that the train horn 
is going to sound louder as the train moves toward you. Now the other option here is as the train moves away from you. And what happens here is as the train moves away from you and the horn is still on that train is it's going to sound a lot softer. So what happened here is the horn waves are going to be expanded from the direction of motion. And so just the opposite is occurring as that train moves away from you. As it moves away from you, those horn sounds are going to be softer because the wave front is lengthened and the pitch is going to be lower. All right, I know I squeezed it in there, but the last point says horns sound softer since wave front is lengthened and the pitch is lower. Uh, now, uh, what else the Doppler effect can be used for? Well, the Doppler effect is used in uh, Doppler radar that the meteorologists use to predict the uh, weather, and it uses the same type of idea that we discussed here in this set of notes. All right, uh, I know it's been another lengthy video. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this particular section. And as always, make sure you subscribe.